Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of All Over Passion. I am here with Chris. How you doing, man? You good? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. Um, Solid. You know what? It, I think it's I think it's going to be a good time to discuss therapy because the, the crap I've seen on the time, we'll get to the game, but I just kind of want to talk about the reaction, the outpour, because look, me and you are fans, I would say, go in the optimistic camp, <laughs> like in general. Okay, and we see the best in the team, and I think that you know I don't want to police other people's opinions, but mate, some of the logic trail that I've seen in the last week has been beyond ridiculous. And you know, I honestly don't know where it comes from, because on the one hand, I knew that there would be a reaction, but this yeah. that there's genuine debate about turmoil, stability, sacking the manager. And we've lost two games in 2024. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, there's there's got to be a certain level of perspective. And look, we can put on one hand that you know the the level of the league demands perfection, and no one's sitting there saying that you know the way we lost you know these games are acceptable. I think there's things to improve. There's things that we can critique on the manager. There's things to critique for the team. But the, the broad stroke, we're never going to win that he's now a Brendan Rodgers. Like, some of the stuff is crazy. Like, okay, how do you respond to what you saw in the last week? How do you contextualize it? I know you don't care what people think, but, like, how do you try to gauge a fan base that's so emotional? I don't know. I've I always expected a massive reaction when we finally got our first loss. I thought after the loss, we probably would have calmed down. But I think the loss came at a point where like Liverpool dropped points. So then if you win, you're basically three points and then, what, 10 goal difference above them. Mm-hmm. So unless you really like lose two of the next six, then Liverpool really don't go past you. So then to, to get that high, I think people were really high off the Liverpool result, even before... Arsenal lineup was out. People were so high on the Liverpool result, and then just to be brought back down to earth in that like five minute period really versus Villa, I think <clears throat> made it even worse to lose in that way and have such a good first half, and then go on to Bayern where you don't really show any like serious danger like the way we did in the first leg. Like we didn't have the same out, same caliber of chances. We didn't concede the same kind of chances, but we didn't generate the same type of chances we have the past week, let alone the past couple of months. Um, and then, yeah, like the, all the nonsense about Saka and comes out and then Arteta has this thing where he says we need a new strike or whatever. Um, yeah, then Arteta route is back. It was mm-hmm. big after the loss, very big after the loss, Arteta out. Um, that we it's impossible to win with him. <clears throat> I said not something similar, but like I think it would be insane to sack Arte a two day, like today for after doing something we haven't done in uh, what ten years, uh, no? yeah, a decade, and challenge him for the title at the same time. I don't f- remember doing that since I don't know challenging for the title at the same time and then being what one one goal away from getting to the semi-final of the Champions League. We haven't been that close. So for me, no, I wouldn't sack Arteta today. No, I'm not Arteta out. If we see the exact same pattern next season, where he fails, he only uses... like there was, I think on that graph I saw, there was like seven players that have less minutes than Ramsdale, which... Yeah. Uh, who's played five games this season. It, it's, it's that spectrum, right? Because I saw the same graph. So people that maybe didn't see the graph, I'll just explain it for you guys and you listeners. You know, there was a graph that essentially outlined the number of minutes that each player had had in the squad. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you had a certain amount of available minutes just in general, right? But there was eight players that have had minute, 80% or more of available minutes in Arsenal. <laughs> Guess how many players Manchester City and Liverpool have in the same metric? City 2, Liverpool 0. Zero. zero at 80%. Yeah, zero, they're just yeah, below. Yeah. Zero. And then you've got eight players that have barely cracked more minutes than Aaron Rams or seven, like you said. The spectrum yeah. of the squad used is utterly uh, ridiculous. That's what we call mismanagement. That's what I'll levy at him in terms of, you know, the criticism that he's really failed to address. And, you know, even the fitness concerns, like we do look physically um, different. 
we do look as a team that have physically lost their edge in second halves mm-hmm. and towards the end of games. But mate, when you're sitting there starting and letting Ben White and you know Martin Odegaard complete 90 minutes against Luton for a 2-0 and then taking them off against Villa a week later because they look tired and they're not able to against a more physical team, that's on you. That's on the manager. Yeah. And so this this idea that, you know, he's perfect in terms of an injury, you know, people people talk about injuries, but you need to be proactive in terms of the injury. We see Ben White strap and we know that he's played through injury at the beginning of the season. We know that he's been playing for a grade three hamstring the season before. It's ridiculous. Like I don't I I don't think um he's helped by some of our injuries, but he also just doesn't help himself. I've used this analogy when I've described Wenger sometimes, but it's almost like you tie his hands and, um, you know, and throw him in a pool, but he pencil dives sometimes. <laughs> and it's like, you know, he really just doesn't help himself in terms of some of these squad management and fitness management concerns. You know, just to wrap up kind of what I saw online, it was ridiculous. I don't want to give breath to a lot of and I also don't want to police a lot of fans, but at some token, you need to follow the logic that you keep saying. Like, if we're going to sit there and we're going to say that we're going to lose the league in a potential way, and, you know, Manchester City are going to go there and they're going to go unbeaten in the remaining fixtures, if you're going to take that logic, Chris, I'm going to ask the stat, what does that make City do, by the way? It's yeah, able to do those. Well, because they lost to Real Madrid, it breaks their unbeaten streak in all comps, but it would mean that they haven't lost since December 6th in the league if they don't. If they so, don't lose next month. And by that logic, I'm sorry. I'm going to hold my hands up and say, yeah, you deserve to win the title at that point. I'm not going to clown my own club for not losing since December the 6th. You know, it's a, it's an incredible statistic. And by the way, they're going to go on a four-peat. It would be historic. Would Manchester City's team become the best team in the Premier League history by that point in terms of was, achievement? You know? All that, the debate would be that they, you could never not mention them in the top what three teams in, in Premier League. Ever. They're already there basically. That like, people yeah. mentioned their 17, 18 team you know, ever. But in this like four or five year period they've had really that like, I don't know you can't I, I I don't know how you can go against a team that's done the treble that's almost did the domestic I think it was the domestic treble but then they lost in the cup to Wigan. Yeah. And then they go four in a row and they've stopped any challenger. Like they stopped a club countless times, Arteta as well, twice. Like it, it would be very, very hard to argue against them being the best ever. But they probably will because they don't, they won all four with getting 90 plus points. Like, and that's been, that has been my point to all of it. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't sit there and say that it's a bottle job. It's the team not getting up to standard. Then it's totally, th- this club will never win anything. You can't have that reaction, but then at the same time say, yeah, but they're competing against the best team to ever do it. And so there has to be some kind of a balance towards it, to be honest with you. And I think that moving forward, you know, um, I just I, I didn't understand how defeatist people are. You're two points off the top, where, by the way, if you actually look at the 10-game rolling average between Manchester City, the form has dropped off. The amount of yes. XG that they're they've giving drawn. up, they've drawn a lot yeah. of stuff. And while maybe not being you know winning exactly, they're definitely dropping points. And so this idea that Manchester City are the, for sure going to be perfect and Liverpool and Arsenal aren't is a stupid narrative. It's very stupid. There's a lot of questions. I, I think for me, with, with the three, <clears throat> I think the positive for us too is that our streaks have come to an end, an end in the sense that at some point you're going to drop points. Like maybe yeah. C's will come next season, like at the start of next season, that Premier League unbeaten run will come. And I don't think it will because then I looked into it again and it's like, what, 23 league games unbeaten? Um, yeah. They would, they would go to, to win the league. Um, we dropped points for for City. Really, they can't draw. Say we don't. Say we just win the rest. Um, yeah. Or six. City can't draw, or we win the league. So. Yeah. And I don't think people clock that because they don't understand. Like if Arsenal win, the goal difference doesn't get made up. 
Like, yeah, it's so it, much it, bigger. It, it's so it's so stupid. Like I've never understood why people don't understand that logic. So, look, fundamentally, it's out of our hands. That's yeah. what people are going to That's hold the issue. Out. That's what I yeah. think is make, is making the the panic bigger and bigger because I think when it's in your hands, then like you really have only you to blame. But then mm-hmm. when it's not in your hands, there's a bit of like wiggle room and in a sense where like, there's so many variables that like, Man City just not if you win every game from now, I don't know how many points we'd get. I think we'd be around like eighty eight or something, eighty nine. The you funny win thing is if you were if you were to use the results of last season and just simulate <clears> them, we win the league. Yeah, like, if they have the know. exact same thing they did. But for me, like I've said it to you, in a title race when Liverpool were hunting down Man City in yeah. game week 37, they drew. They gave yeah. Liverpool a chance. Like They gave Liverpool a chance and Man City had to come back down from 2-0 on the last day to win the league. Um, frankly, it's top quality players versus top quality players. Things happen. City can drop points. They're not invincible. They have dropped points before. They have mm-hmm. drawn, drawn. They haven't won every single game in the league. And for me, I think it's a bit better that they, they're facing lower teams, like going for Europe, like Tottenham. Now that everyone, a positive is that now that everyone's out, now that everyone's out, Tottenham have to go for fourth. They can't go yeah. for fifth. Fifth is not an option anymore. Same as Villa. Fifth is not an option anymore. So how did that dynamic change the way Tottenham face all three teams in the running. Um, Forest facing relegation. Um, Brighton not really have anything to play for. West Ham have something to play for. So they've got teams that do have something to play for, but also teams that that West Ham don't have a bad, rep, a very bad record versus Man City. They do well versus them. Mm-hmm. Brighton as well. So for me, like six games, if they do win it. If they do win them all, I'll be su- I'll be surprised a bit, but then I'll be like they're the best team ever. But well, yeah, like a hundred percent. And I think what you're looking at at this point, right, is you need to just put the points on the board. And so, from an Arsenal perspective, obviously, Man City's got the FA Cup semi-finals going on this weekend. So, really, all that you have to do is win your Wolves game against, and we'll preview that at the end of it with major injuries. So you sit there and you start to put yeah. points up on the board. And I'm telling you. Anybody that watched the documentary, mate, they're watching it in the dressing room. You don't think the pressure yeah, an hour before their there. game. Yeah, like come on. Like, you know what? Like I, I'm really tired of kind of the narratives that people do and they just keep talking about the worst case scenario for your own team, but then project the best case scenario for the alternate so, team. And I'm just like, your logic doesn't make sense. If you're gonna be pessimistic, be pessimistic for both teams and see where you land, essentially. You know, you can't pick and choose when you're gonna do it. But anyways, I think that's enough on critiquing other people, even though that's yeah. my favorite thing to do. Um, let's talk the game, because there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, on the night, I'm going to be very honest, second half, for me, I'll go as far to say I was a little disgusted. I was actually more disappointed in this game than I was against Villa, um, because I felt like Villa, there was a clear physical drop-off, but for me, the second half was a little bit more of us giving up. As a, I didn't see a physical drop off. It was more of a yeah. mental giving up, and that's what I don't appreciate from the game. But generally speaking, let's just keep it first half. Like, a, how did what did you make the lineups, and then what did you make of <clears> what <throat> I felt was a very competitive first half? If anything, we should have been up. Yeah, I think the lineups. Well, in on the stream before, I said I didn't want Jorginho to start another mm-hmm. game for the club, really, but he did start. And so I wasn't really happy with that. But then Tommy asked, you gave me confidence in the sense that the last two games we suffered on our left back was 1v1. Here we are, like they forced Sane 1v1 a lot, even on a, all the way into their own half. They wanted Sane, here we are 1v1 because then you get past him, you're in transition. So with Tommy Asu, I was very confident that <clears throat> Sane's transition threat would be nullified, and it was. Um, Apart from one time where Tomiyasu misjudged the ball over the top, Sonny didn't do much worse him. So I was happy with that. And then I didn't want Georgina to play. I wanted Rice or, I mean, sorry, Partey or Smith Rowe. Smith Rowe, I just think in this game, like, there was so much space for someone to just turn and just drive with the ball. 
essentially that like, commit players with the ball at your feet that like, we're not just going to be able to pass around especially if you're not going to play dangerous ball centrally I think we lack that a lot um, no one was taking risks in the middle of the park and against a team willing to sit in in their half even at home if they're willing to do that then you need a player like party either party to do it with passes or <clears throat> Smith Rowe to do it with his movement and with his dribbling. We did we lacked that dynamism in the middle, which is a big reason why I didn't want Georgina to play. And then Kai Havertz, I wasn't like angry, but then I but with uh, no space in behind, how dangerous is he really? Like, if a team's not gonna allow him to run in behind a lot, how dangerous is he really? And we saw he wasn't. The subs annoyed me, but we'll get into that when we go into the second half. But yeah, and then into the first half, I think we did well. I think we generated some chances. We did a very good job of locking down Musiala, I felt. He wasn't really impactful in the first half, similar to Kane. I think when he took away that, because he turns and just whips it to the right winger very regularly. When he took that away with Tommy Asu, Kane wasn't as impactful. Um, but here, yeah, like Saka didn't really have a great game. He wasn't really involved. We had the best chance of the half, I would say, with Martinelli on that edge of the box, straight into what's his name, Neuer, who had a good game as well. Oh, I think Martinelli had a good game today, not today, yeah. sorry, Wednesday, one v one with Kimmich. He had a, a much better game than we had on the left hand side in the first leg, but yeah. The danger wasn't like, oh, we should have scored, but like like a Villa or like Bayern first half as well. Like we had guaranteed goals in there. But I think we were the better team in the first half though. Mm -hmm. The second half. I think that there was just moments that, you know, um, look on the counter, Bayern always are going to be really good. I mean, that's what they've made their career, their heritage based off of. And you know, they still have excellent outlets. I thought even Guerrero did well in moments against isolation with Ben. You know, um, there was just some times that he was able to peel away and get away from him. But I was just going to pick up on your point on Neuer because I just feel like he he's the greatest goalkeeper of all time, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. He That guy, um, he's, he's just so good. The way he would beat our press, for me, was what killed us. Like, we had a press that was working at any time that, you know, Neuer wasn't the one that was dictating it. We did well. If you noticed, any time there was a trigger or a dire, we did very well to nick things off at that point. But when Neuer puts his foot on the ball, mate, he's able to look right and then cross field left and chip it over. And he can, yeah, flick, over, flick up the ball and yeah. just chip it over players. Like. It's, it's, it's actually stupid. Like, I've never seen a goalkeeper able to do that. So um, that was one thing. But I just think in general, like, there was a moment where I just felt that Saka takes the ball the first time and burns Masrawi right off the bat in the first five mm. minutes. I'm thinking, well, we're going to have a game. And mm. the amount of times that we fed Saka was so minimal. And it was frustrating to me. I felt like in the game, we were dominating possession, but we were slow. Gabriel was really ponderous in possession. He, you know, we would work play off to the left or at least try to. And then we never switch it effectively to the right. We did it one time and Saka burnt and left Masrawi like licking his toes. It was just, um, uh, and then a uh, frustrating first half, I would say, but at least I felt it was competitive in a sense. And while there was definitely some transitions, I, I agree with you, Tommy Asu walks up Sané. I was never really worried about um, any 1v1 battles. There was that one floated cross early in the first half that, you know, he misjudges. But ever since yeah. then, Tommy really grew into the game. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing asset to have because at the very least, I know no one wants to hear this, but I think Tommy Asu is fit. You can't tell me he's not fit. He pulled the 90 minutes, and so I'm looking at it and saying, you better be worth the contract extension that you were given at this point. Like, I mean, you have six games left in the season. If you're telling me after all this whole season that you've been away from injury, okay, you've played almost equal parts for Japan and Arsenal. That's mad. You know, people understand that. that You better be fit. Because I think while we work back the dream and the possibility of Timber coming back, Tommy Asu is our best balancer in terms of giving us a defensive lockdown ability as well as somebody that can move the ball quickly. Like, I don't think he's very expansive. But at least he moves the ball quickly. And, you know, I think a big problem for us is that we reach a case when we face these mid-blocks 
we're stale in possession. We're not brave enough between the lines. And I don't think he individually is brave, but at least he gives it to players that can be. And that's the only thing I need. If you're not going to be brave on the ball, you're not going to clip it. Which, by the way, I think he has in his locker. But, I mean, first game back, I'm not going to be hypercritical, right? But um, I just I just think it's better to have players that will get rid and change and switch pace instead of the typical <clears throat> let's hold on to the ball, let's knock it forward, let's roll it. You know that thing when you roll up the sole of your foot and you just keep checking, no, no. checking, checking, and then you turn back? And it's just, I don't know, it, it, it frustrates I think, I think me. The main benefit of him for me really was the Sonny was their main threat in the in that first leg. Like mm -hmm. the, their penalty, their goal came from the right hand. Their first goal came from the right hand side. Um, he just kept getting in behind Kiwi and causing Gabriel like not problems in <clears throat> in the sense like oh he ruined Gabriel's day night. Sorry, but I think he just forced Gabriel wide a lot more. But with Tommy Asius, like you can. Gabriel can stay central. Gabriel can stay on his Kane assignment a lot more. You do well, lack a bit on the ball, mm -hmm. but I think in the big, in the especially with the team that's going to count, you have to take that risk, man. You have to mm -hmm. concede the like total fluidity offensively for looking on a team's biggest threat. I think centrally he could have like in build up. He took a bigger he took on a bigger role than I thought he would. He came to receive from the center backs turn and face. He got Martinelli involved a lot more than he's been involved in for a while, actually. I think Martinelli was very present, especially in that first half. Second half, we weren't really on it at all. But first half, Tommy Arcee was a big part of why we had success offensively and def defensively. What did you make of like we spoke we and you during the game, I think, from 10 minutes on it? Was saying that I'd much rather risk the pass central than just recycle it to your center backs or recycle it to Tommy Arsu. What did you make of Jorginho Rice, like centrally to have a, even involve Havertz, like the link up and the progression centrally? What did you make of it? It was, it was, it was poor. It's what we were bemoaning in the chat. It was calling for Thomas Partey between the lines because it was just far too safe. And, you know, the one time we were actually adventurous in terms of release Odegaard in the pocket is the chance where Martinelli has that um, first time shot kind of at the top of the yeah. box, remember? And so it's the one time it led to that piece of play. And, you know, um, mate, he's got to do better. Like top of the box, they're opening it up. And I mean, look, I have this theory that I think he's just been so wasted on the touchline that he's had to lose his instincts in a sense in the box. Like Martinelli, when he first arrives, buries that. Like no questions asked. And he's just hesitating on his finishing and his final action because he's constantly being told to hold, recycle, and touch regain, basically. That's all he's doing. He's doing He's been, really, he's, like, he's been very different. Oh, he's that's really going to be a different way, but uh, at some points it's been very negative. But yeah, I know it's, it's just it's beyond ridiculous. But you know that's a that's a huge chance, mate. And you know what? Like you know what annoys me too about it? Like I don't even need you to take it first time. Control it. Like you have no one around you. Like take a touch mm -hmm. off the left, set it up on the right, give the keeper the eyes, send them one way. That's like mm. you're, you're, it, you have the time to do that. So that was the one chance that I think is glaring. And for all of the spot counters that Bayern had, they never created a chance like that. That was a huge, huge chance. Um, and it comes also from, you know, Dyer and, sorry, Dyer, but Mateus De Ligt just not being able to react, you know, and quickly enough. I think Martin Odegaard is a really good pass inside to find Martinelli, but it's just, you know, De Ligt is just unable to react. He's too square. And I don't think we did that enough. Like, we didn't isolate their center backs enough in terms of, you know, trying to force them to make errors. It was it was definitely something that, you know, frustrated me in the half. And then towards the end, we pick up set pieces, which I think I got really annoyed with because in the first half, Declan swings in a really good header that I think Kai has to do better on. Like, you know, it's probably a little bit harsh, but I mean, come on, like, you got to at least put some oomph into the header to yeah, guide it back. He's trying, to, he's trying to do some weird header thing to score himself. And I'm like, mate, you're never getting that. Why are you trying to use the back of your head to direct something when you don't even know where it's going? Like, just guide it on. Just glance the header for a knock-on for someone else. That's the job as the first runner. So that was poor. I just think set pieces in general on the night were poor. We were tired. 
It wasn't great. It was the one good set piece we had to kind of end the half. And, you know, it's another good chance. I don't think it's a great chance, but it's another good chance to get something on target that we kind of squander. Um, but for you, in terms of us ending the half, I think there was a big push. What did you make about halftime? And what did you make about the start of the second half, essentially? Like, um, I think we had our best moments towards the end of the half. I mean, the Martinelli chance comes around the 30th minute. You know, the set piece chance comes around, like, the 38th minute or whatever. Um, you know, and then, and then towards the end of the half, I'm pretty sure we have a really good job about pressing Bayern deep in their buildup, right? And we steal the ball. And um, we have another chance right before half to really penetrate Neuer. But, I mean, we just don't, we don't have final action, really. How did you make kind of the start of the second half and our approach towards it? Well, I think I think half time was I wouldn't say confident that we get the job done. I'd say like I wasn't oh, we're gonna lose. I wasn't worrying that the game was over. I think we were yeah. very much in the game. If Lima doesn't get that great interception, we're probably going up one nil. Um it was a great press from Rice and then we move on to that. But yeah, like I've, recently we haven't started second half well at all. Yeah. Bayern, Bayern, we started poorly. Um, Villa, we started poorly, and this time we started poorly again. I think Bayern was really on on job in the second half. Mm -hmm. They really pressure on us. They generated a lot more chances. I think they had more possession as well in that second half compared to the first half. Like I think Bayern, I think I don't know. I don't know, like, it's the, I think it's the most shots we've conceded this season. Not this season, sorry, in the past three months and a half. 11, I think it was. They generated a lot of chances. The goal they scored um, was really Martinelli badly tracking his runner. But personally, thinking about it back, like, with the little numbers they had in the box compared to what we had in the box, why, why was our left winger tracking image? On a, on a cross from from the box like one of the centre backs yeah. could have a DM and a centre mid someone before someone in the front line has to head the head on the edge of the six yard box it was a great head on it was a great goal and it wasn't the first chance really of the that half where you could say oh maybe they're going to score it I think there was a building anticipation of we're going to concede it probably because they were generating corners and we weren't I think by the time they scored they had six corners and we had zero so you mm -hmm. can see our our offensive output really was nothing until they scored and then they forced us to try and make something in the game i said at half time within 10 minutes if we can't create anything from central areas take off Jorginho. and mm -hmm. havertz as well really like he was rubbish for me Especially when he moved to left center. I mean, he was, it was like playing with 10 men without a red card. He didn't do anything. But I think the most frustrating part is because we've seen that configuration. We know it doesn't work. <laughs> and especially yeah. against a physical team. Like, okay, it works potentially in a mid block where you're trying to exploit an offside trap like Villa, but it never works in a physical matchup. And I think the worst part of all of this, mate, was Bakayo Saka. In the first half, he was able free to move to the left central. I saw him popping up in different areas. Mate, he played as a glorified wing back in the second half. Yeah. That was from instruction. And look, some of it is tactical where the way that basically Tuchel, what he did was he doubled up on Saka and Odegaard to have no entry there. And he basically said, okay, we're going to stop the right-hand side from working. Bet yeah. that you can work off the left. <laughs> and we couldn't. So... Um, it's just, it's very frustrating because I think it comes from very simple fixes and I don't think that it, you know, it, it was something that we could have changed for sure. I think whether or not you want to debate if Thomas Partey's fit or not, even Emile Smith-Rowe, a, a ball carrier in the left half space that isn't somebody that's going to just regain it, but an actual central running power midfielder does more with those minutes. And, um, I think part of my frustration is towards the end of the half, right? You're looking at Mikel's substitutions and, you know, they're substituting players with different profiles, but asking them to play the same way. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, what are you doing? And then you ask Eddie to save your season again in the last five minutes. That was disgusting. Honestly, I think bringing yeah. on Eddie to play four minutes in this, in this, similar to when he brought on party to play four minutes in the first leg, like, 
Yeah. What do you think he's going to do in four minutes? He hasn't played in a month. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. You just throw people under the bus. He made the same subs he makes every time he hits sixty-seven minutes. Trossard yeah. and Jesus. We knew Trossard and Jesus were going to come on. Where they were going to play, we didn't know. But then we saw Trossard left from Jesus up top. Havertz left centre mid. Within a minute, you could see that that wasn't working because they had that Leroy Sane chance where he put it over the bar. Imagine that was in the games. The game's done. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, we generate one big chance. Jesus, he was off potentially. We don't know. They just gave the off because you don't need to check it. If he's really His decision making is so poor in that moment, isn't it? Like to take it wide, yeah. like, and you know, and if for people that still want to question when I start to talk about him physically being done, look at that chance again and tell me Jesus pre-surgery gets there. Like, it's it's sad. It's it's like it, it it is. He's definitely got a physical issue that I'm really afraid that never comes back fully. Yeah. And you know, decision making to take it wide, and I mean, not even test the goalkeeper. Like, mate, I don't know about you, but like when you're in that position, every single coach, I don't care where you are, soccer, football, is telling you either you go across the keeper or you go high. It's not it's not something that you've got to debate. And, you know, yeah. going high is stupid because the keeper's got the near post covered. They always yeah. tell you, shoot across goal. Everybody tells you that. And the way he shoots his body, like he angles his body, made, and I could just say, you're falling over. Like I'm, I'm mid-sentence. I'm, I could see you falling over. Look, it's frustrating. You're not going to kill him for missing one of the only chances he had. But the problem that I've got, made is if Bayern get that chance, that's a goal. If Victor Osman's down there, it's a goal. And these are the moments. These are the moments that we lack. We don't lack goals in the team. We lack somebody able to take that chance. And, yeah. you know, that transitional inevitability is something that I just think this team is desperately crying out for. It's I desperately so. crying out for. And, you know, by the way, Alexander Isaac, I think, does the business down there in that same position. It's, it, it, you can choose whatever profile that you really like to see, whatever your aesthetics like. But, you can't. We can't be winning things in terms of having uh, or rotating a player that has significant minutes doing decisions like that. And he's an experienced yeah. player. Like the reason I'm so harsh on him is he's got the best record in the competition in the squad. He knows what it takes. He's been there. He's done it. He knows the pressure. And if you're, I'm sorry, if you're going to be loud in terms of demanding, I'm a number nine. Don't put me on the way. Then put that way. Like. You know, and at least make the keeper work. Like at least force a great save. Like in those moments, any save, if, mate. I would have been okay yeah. with any save on target. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, do exactly something. Like that in mind, that they didn't yeah. have to check the offside. The offside is close, but you just give it offside because he put it into Rose. It was honestly horrible. But then after that, just like he slumped into the floor with his head on the floor. I think the whole fan base was like, "Yeah, this game is done." And they gave up. The fan base, the players gave up. And I think that was the biggest frustration for me in general. And I don't blame the players that came on. I don't, uh, I I think think you can't. Like, you're not set up in a position to really do anything. But look, mate, it comes down to the question. There needs to be a point that Mikel needs to trust his squad. And I can't keep repeating this. I don't want to keep going over the same cons we've already done. So I won't ask that. But for you, we, we've got Wolves approaching. We've yeah. seen now two different mid-blocks. And given the injuries, I'll just run it through. Ryan Aitneri is probably not fit enough to start. He's probably on the bench. Wang Chen Li has only got 45 minutes in him. Samito's yeah. out. Kuna's out. Pedro Neto's out. Uh, Dawson's out. Who else is there? Is Bereda? Is that, is that a snake? Also out. Um, they've got players that basically lack any transitional threat. And we're facing another mid-block. Martin O'Neill is a good coach, but is he somebody that is able to coax out goals? I don't know. I think Wolves are probably one of the strongest teams without possession uh, in the league in terms of being able to do a lot with little possession. And they just release their outlets. That's what they do. But again, their outlets are all injured. So how do you approach this game, mate? Um, and I know you're, we're going to talk about a rotated 11, but I think, you know what, we might have a debate about it because I think you're always more rotating kind of in mindset than I am in general. Yeah. But who do you think is the most important 
player to rotate here. Because uh, I think you're always going to lean on the side of, I'll rotate most of the 11, George, you know me. But for me... I, the last I probably, line, I, you, I, I think <laughs> I rotated the whole 11. You did. Pop keeper. <laughs> you, you, you did, and, and I, I'm more of a fan of, like, I still think that we need three or four subs, and then I'll rotate big at the 60th minute if I'm winning the game. But yeah. you, who's key, and why is it Thomas Partey and Jorginho? <laughs> cool. Rice has been dead on his feet for a while. We spoke about this, like, yeah. a lot. Um, Rice has been dead on his feet for a while. Saliba also. Um, Saliba's played the third most minutes of any player in the league. Um, but after getting injured last season, it shows maybe that the injury isn't common, but also it also shows that if a player getting injured derailed your whole season, why would you risk them getting injured just from overplaying? Um, Gabriel has also looked unfit for a bit. Um, Saka as well. So I think I'd rest Saka, Rice, probably Gabriel. The lineup I gave you, you know, I was laughing. I even gave Cedric nicknames. So it was a joke in a, in the sense of changing the whole, all 10 outfield players. But I think we need something really drastic because I think Luton was a breath of fresh air in seeing that party, Smith Rowe, or Reese sort of restarted. Um, did Eddie start? No. Eddie didn't start versus Luton, but somehow he it makes sense to bring him on versus Bayern Munich when your season on the line. Anyways, <clears throat> I think Tommy Asu probably gets the rest, you know. Tommy Asu probably gets the rest. Should he yeah. though? I mean, like, I mean, to be fair, you could probably work it because they don't have outlets, but I mean, I'm just yeah. I'm I, I'd want to demand him being able to play. I think their biggest threat in Bayern would probably be I don't know, Sarabia. Like the biggest threat in their mm. front line, front line, not in not in Bayern because he doesn't have pace. But I mean, like the biggest threat in their front line with Cunha out is probably Sarabia. Yeah. So if if that's what you're giving me, then you can play Zinchenko. You can play Zinchenko there. We probably do play Zinchenko, and then yeah, for me, Reese Reese has to get the start over Saka. Reese or he probably goes Jesus. I just have to think about Arteta. I think the squad hasn't been used as much. So, rest, you can give him a rest against Mario Lemina and Tommy Doyle. Play Thomas Party, please. If we're assuming they're going to sit deep and try to counter us, then we see, we've seen our struggle against Bayern Munich to break through them centrally and just forced wide, forced wide. But then we don't have an aerial threat in the box to even you to aim our crosses at. So, yeah, I think... How many changes do I think Arteta will make? His comments I mean, just are not a lot, but for me, I'd make at least seven, eight. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. What would, like, your lineup, what would your lineup be? Um, probably, probably. Uh, I hate that he's playing so much, but it has to be. I think Ben White, Saliba. I think Kiv, uh, Kivior can come in for Gabriel because I think Gabriel has been uh, shaky for a while and he's not. He's not been himself physically. Like, I think you yeah. can tell that there's been some issues. So I'd put Kivior in. Um, left back, um, I probably want... I don't mind who we put left back, to be honest with you. Um, I think that we're going to be facing a mid-block. So I would like Kiv... I, I think Kivior is already playing at left centre back, so maybe Zinchenko or Tommy. I really don't care Yeah. Um, who at that point. Probably Zinchenko, only because I'd like to have Thomas Partey. I'm not playing uh, Declan Rice, so I'd like to have that unit in there, essentially. Um, and they've played together, so I'd probably do that. And then I'd have Martin Odegaard, and um, I'd have Emile Smith-Rowe. Um, you know, entering, I think they'd leave spaces in the midfield, so I think that this is a perfect time to have that exploited, and I think um, definitely would play Martinelli because I don't think he needs rest, I think he needs minutes. Like, he needs to be played into form and I think it would be nice to have a runner like that. I would encourage Emil to press up ahead with him. And I think that, you know, I'd still probably play Kai Havertz and Bakayo Saka as well, only because with having a mid block, I'd like to probably get him into form and run into the space and just stretch them so that you could have an opportunity for um, Emil and basically Bakayo to do some stuff in the center of the pitch. Um, but then at the 60th minute, I'd be hoping to try to get 
um, some space, some kind of well, not space, but some um, some Odegaard subs and some of the Kaiosaka subs. And um, well, I'm assuming you'd you'd start them two for the next three games that we have over another eight eight day period. For sure. Yes. And that's really scary for me. For me personally, like I'd I'd rest Saka a bit. Like I think he's just really just even though he's played the least of all like the six that have played 28 nineties in the league, he's the one he definitely, just, he definitely looked tired the second half, you know. But I, I think yeah. for me, like I just I want him to get a goal. And I can I can feel it smelling. Like he he really wanted it. I thought he would score against Bayern. I mean, once I saw them as Rowley okay. saying, I think we fed him, you know. But um, I think he needs a goal. And, and uh, I just think Wolves is the perfect thing. And I think he's going to break the deadlock for us. I, I do he has scored that. in the last two versus Wolves head to head. So he likes he does them. Well against them. Yeah, he does. I think for me, I wouldn't play Havertz. I don't think he warrants a start. His former, for me, has, one has been poor, but also this, like, we have to. We have players that can play there. We have Trossard, we have Enketia, who I think everyone's 90% sure he's leaving if he's being treated like this. So Enketia's probably leaving. Um, so Jesus as well could play up top. I think um, Wolves have just allowed cutbacks recently. Look at the goals they've conceded. have come from midfielders and like second strikers running in late on the edge of the box scoring. So for me, whoever starts left center mid probably does end up scoring. Um, I think it should be Smith or I did say to you, I think I don't know what number I said. I think a thousand percent sure if Smith for starts, he probably scores against Wolves. I'll be very confident he does that. Hopefully, we get the game done. He early. should get ninety minutes if he does play. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, I think if you're bringing in someone that you haven't played for a while, they should just get. 90 minutes, regardless of... Well, I wouldn't say regardless of their performance, because if they're scoring on goals, then you have to take them off. But, yeah, guys like Smith for a party, rest rice, man. The running you have them doing for Jorginho, seeming like it's going to continue for the rest of the season. Rest his legs, please. Because yeah. last season was for West Ham, I saw Rice play 900 minutes in, in a... Sorry, 800 and something minutes in a month. And he didn't look at, as done as he, he looks now, which is... It's scary. But it means that at no point he's arrested this season. Like even for West Ham, they would go into a, a round of 16 and he doesn't play at all. Like all 90 minutes, he doesn't play. FA Cup, he didn't play. For us, he played in the FA Cup because we played Liverpool, I believe. Yeah, he played in the FA Cup versus Liverpool and then he's played in every... played 90 in every Champions League game. Yeah, and he played a lot in the group stage. So yeah, Rice has played a lot of football for us. Saliba's played the most and I think he's conserved energy a bit recently. Gabriel took the the Rice assignment, not Rice, sorry, Kane assignment, but usually Saliba's involved in that a lot more. So yeah, for me, I'd make a bit more changes than than, than George. I'd probably... Um, the lineup I gave George, I'll say to you guys now, was Cedric, <laughs> Ben White, who was the last one about? Kiwio, Tommy Arsu, and then I had Partey, Odegaard. Oh, did I have Odegaard or Vieira? Do you even remember? You um, had Odegaard and Vieira. Yeah, and then Reese Nelson and who did I have? I have a, but that, <laughs> you did a lot. <laughs> Look, you know what I wanted to ask you? So say you've got Thomas. Who do you have at left back again? Because what's your back so, line? Tommy kill your white and Cedric. That was the that was the lineup I proposed. Mm. And White comes off at 60. Move Tommy over and bring on Zinchenko. So you so you're bringing on Zinchenko? Now that I think about it, probably start Zinchenko. You know what I'm thinking? The space in the midfield, he won't get caught. So he'll have a field day. And people are going to yeah. talk about why was Zinchenko not in this game for so long. And you know what? To be honest with yeah. you, I just I don't think that there's going to be a Zinchenko game for a little while. <laughs> so, like, I need to have minutes in the next six games. And I think Bournemouth would be a Zinchenko game. But Chelsea oh, and Spurs are not Zinchenko. He shouldn't touch the pitch. Yeah. So, Same as Jorginho, man. 
No. Jorginho in both those games. If I, I remember both those games vividly. Mm. In the midfield, Gallagher ran him ragged. Um, and then if he's Son, next, you got Son, I think, a Declan Rice parte pivot for Chelsea yeah. Spurs. That's what you need. Hopefully. And, and so so we gotta work him into fitness. We got to work him into fitness. And so um yeah, I think this is the perfect game. Do you, so we'll end on this. Um Wolves coming up. What do you think the score is? Do you think I know we won't get the rotation that you believe, but do you think we'll rotate the squad, period? Do you think that there's going to. to be some kind of change? We have to. If if we don't, then we lose one of Spurs or Chelsea. Mm-hmm. Because I think when you play Chelsea Tuesday, you play Chelsea midweek and then Spurs on the weekend. So let me double check what day we play Chelsea. We play Chelsea Tuesday, 8 p.m. Have to wrap, hopefully wrap up the the Wolves game early, rest people and then play Chelsea. If you don't rotate, we I think we lose Chelsea. If we don't rotate, we lose against Chelsea. That's mm-hmm. how much I think we need to rotate. If we do rotate, maybe not to the extent I want, because that doesn't happen. Even if us looting, it didn't happen. So, um, f- three now, two now. Oh, it's, 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 I'll say three now, yeah, because like I think the the goals are there. Like, they've conceded a lot of chances yeah. recently. They'll probably concede on set pieces as well. I think Dawson. Awesome. I was really hoping to convince you to go and join Mafia because I really wanted a three 0 score line myself. Yeah. Um, I think I think a clean sheet's guaranteed. To be honest with you, and it's not because I disrespect Wolves; it's because their whole outlets are gone, and I just yeah, don't if see they have one, it. It'll be. I would even propose this stupid, like, not Cedric. That's my boy, man. But like, <laughs> here we are, Tommy R.C. Wood them in, in the same defense. I would <laughs> never, uh, but. Like with the their lack of outlets, you have to like, surely the game's done by 50, 60. Hopefully, anyways, because then everyone's a little bit less stressed out. Visually, we're top of the league. Mm. I think that's the benefit as well. When when people just click over, you look at the league table, Arsenal's top. Like you even forget a bit that see have a game in in the last week of the season. So yeah. Make a couple so Yours is free now as well. Who do you think scores? Saka, Emil, and Martinelli. Oh, Saka Nelly. Mm. Oh, the OG free. <laughs> um, do you guys think... see a piece goal on this? Sorry? I, I want one. Do you got a set piece goal potentially on this? I I don't have Gabrielle starting, so I lost so... my set piece threat. <laughs> um... If Vieira starts, yeah. Mm. If Vieira starts, I think he scores a free kick. That sounds mad. But Crazy. yeah, we don't score free kick. Okay, last thing. What did you think of not taking the free kick and, and taking it fast at the end of Bayern? Um, I thought it was smart because there's no one on the pitch that we have a set-piece threat with. Mm. And Ben was open. A lot of people complained that Saka like, passing the ball quickly. What do you think of it? I don't think it was I, rushed. I think it was heads up. I was like, at first, I was like, oh, right, edge of the box, you could walk. Then I was like, who? Who's? We haven't scored yeah. a direct kick all season. That's what so I mean. We, and we don't even have Shaka, who's like, maybe on a set yeah. piece. You know, like, if it's if there's no Vieira, then there's nothing. I think the last time that we actually scored a set piece, to be fair, was Martin Odegaard from a similar position, but off the left. Mm. Yeah, Instead yeah. of the right. But then the corner was horrible, uh, like. That's the one. If you want to see Bakayo Saka's tired, watch that corner again. <laughs> well, he was finished. That's one of those ones that you're trying to pick up your leg to take the corner kick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, did, he barely even got it to Goretzka, let alone getting it past him. No, it's that mad. But... Okay, you know what? Well, let's end on a topic that everyone wants to discuss transfers because everyone's sick in the head. Um, yeah. For you... I want Chris's ideal positions and give me one or two names for each of them. And just quick off the bat, uh, you don't have to defend them. Just like you're subjective. Don't try to become Arteta. By the way, I hate this. I hate when people are like, well, it's not feasible. It's not what Mikel would do. It's like, well, I'm I'm not worried about what he would do. I'm asking you what you would like to see in the team. So 
how, how do you want how do you want to construct it because i feel like this summer could go legitimately a million ways and i'm normally really confident about what i want to select but i feel like mm. between left back between even midfield and even our marquee forward there's just so many ways that you can construct this team they don't need a lot but i think there's so many ways you could do it and still be successful yeah. um striker that's non-negotiable like i have to get number nine i need 20 goals like you know me like past couple of seasons i wanted a striker but then we could have done without it like but no nah, man i need goals man mm. saka being a scorer this low is it's horrible, man. He hasn't done yeah. nothing past couple of games. He still hasn't even got his double double. <laughs> God, but yeah, striker, Isak or Ossie, man. Either or, I'll, I'll be happy with you. But Do you have a preference to that type of striker? You know, like I have a preference to like the panel runners in general. Do you, do you have? Do you actually have a preference? Nah, not really. Like re I just like recently I've watched ESAP yeah like this season I've watched him play since Wilson's been out because Newcastle I just like watching them play like regardless of who's on the wings if it's Gordon if it's Murphy if it's Barnes if it's who else has played right wing whoever plays there like he combines well with everyone mm -hmm. but then I also think back to like you know when the game is like on the line like he he can drift left wing and do what he did against yeah. Everton and just go past every go past five players on the touchline and tiptoe in on the byline and put the ball across and we score like that that doesn't exist in well exists no. in our team it exists in our team a bit in space but with no space that doesn't happen with us um so yeah it's like i don't it's like might be my preference i don't think i like if if ossiman is signed tomorrow i'll smile with the exact same smile i'll For smile sure. with it's like saying that's yeah, my yeah, thing yeah. Whoever you get, with, if Isak is 30 million more, I'm not sure I'd prefer Isak then. It's like, the money's yeah. not mine. But like, if you're going to spend an extra 30 million on Isak, I'm not sure if it's worth it. And then I think the issue for me like, is I'm 100% sure Brooke is ready to come back. I'm like 80% of the way there. Um, so I maybe think surely the Cedric role, like even if he's yeah. not perfect, yeah. You know? like Cedric Elneny, I don't even count as part of the squad. Um, he's just there to take money from us, like a little paycheck, having comfy living in London, doing his doing his the charity work he does in London. Like that's what they're paying him for appearance. Yeah, community. he doesn't complain yeah. at all. He gives us good good PR. <laughs> well, maybe I don't even count. I assume Jorginho is leaving. If party leaves, I'd get a DM. Um, yeah. Chris, DM, 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 DM. I couldn't tell you, George. I don't have a name for DM. And I mm -hmm. usually have a name, but then uh, it just depends on like who comes available. Okay, let me let me ask you. So, like, say you've got like a deep line playmaker. You've got Joshua Kimmich. You've got mm -hmm. um, a Frankie De Jong. Uh, are you more looking like that, or are you looking more in like the Kepren Thuram, the Onana phase, like a more physical? Uh, Kepren Thuram, love that player, man. Um, yeah. But same, yeah. I love Kimmich. Kimmich, comfortable outside one v one, comfortable on the ball as well, can actually run. I really I'm really looking at Kimmich a lot more personally because I think last year of his contract, he won't be worth a lot. And I think he's like one of the best experienced people that we can Yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a leader, quote-unquote leader. Huge. Uh, and he can do left back, right back, pivot. Like, there's so many things that he yeah. can do. So I don't, I don't think, even though he's 29, like, we need experience. Like, we have Miles Lewis, Skelly, Ethan, and Neri coming up. I'm not worried about... The I'm so tired. I'm personally tired of, the, of calling for anyone under 23. We have yeah. enough. We have it like, like all 23. <laughs> yeah, people are complaining the squad is is rubbish, yeah. But then in the same <laughs> sentence will we'll propose to me like Josh Xerxes or someone someone young. <laughs> like how does that make sense? We we're not gonna use any youngsters because they're young and inexperienced, but let's sign another youngster. It doesn't it doesn't make sense. No knock on Xerxes, he's a baller, but yeah, like I've either end of the spectrum you go in centre mid. Please have some P and B. Like I, I can't have what Jorginho does versus Chelsea, where the, there's like a 
30 yard gap between him and the left center mid because of him. Stuff if like you that. could right now get a golden ticket, but you could guarantee either one of Thomas Partey or Jorginho stays. And yeah. with, when that comes with it. Uh, and I, I, have to pay, you know, I have to pay Jorginho's flower the country. You know I'll fuck that money up. Like. <laughs> even, even if he wants to go business class, I'll pay his flat to the other country. What? Jorginho will party. Come on, man. I'll pay out his, his, his oh, business outside of to leave. Like. I'll pay that myself. Party oh, that's so funny. Because like, so at this point... I just, yeah, I just wanted a reaction at this point. Because at this yeah, point, yeah, the, the injuries hasn't isn't the reason Party's not playing because he's been fit. So if Party's been fit in the running, he's been fit April, he's gonna be fit May, he was fit in March, then Arteta just didn't play him. Mm -hmm. So we have Party for me, and then Timber coming back makes me like calm down on the left back thing. Can I really advocate for a left back when we've got four playing there? You know what the problem I've got, mate, with it is like I trust in, like I obviously trust Timber. I think he's great, but I've made no qualms about saying I think he could be a Caicedo. I think he could be an option in midfield. Mm. And that's the only reason why I'm kind of on the left back train in general, yeah. because I feel like I'm going to use him in midfield primarily as opposed to like the left back. And so that's why I'm thinking about it. Central midfielder, I'm kind of with you. I always change. I really think it depends on the marquee forward. Like when I look at basically yeah. Osman, right? I could see a case, and I, I know we've both said this in the past, I don't like spending big money at fullback, but say we got Osman. I'm looking at Theo Hernandez, who I know is leaving, and I'm saying <laughs> that connection could be electric. You know, crossing, it would be a cheat code. It would be the pumped up Kieran Tierney. And we've already got, you know, Timber. And it, would, it would basically, I think it'd be one, even though that you're spending a lot on left back, it would make the least funds. Because getting those two and you're technically done. Maybe those two yeah. and a Kimmich, for example. Because for me, yeah, I mm. I can't I like I can't be comfortable signing another six players this summer. No, six, me neither. Another six men coming into the team is honestly for me ridiculous because one, he hasn't shown me that he's gonna use the players we have currently. Like yeah. he's all he's bought all of them, they're all his players. Um, how can I comfortably like say, oh, we're gonna spend another two fifty mil on more players that he potentially doesn't use? And then recently, I thought about the centre back role, but then at the same time, like White can move over into centre back if you if Brook and Kimmich say Kimmich comes and Brook stays, then White probably plays a lot more centre back minutes than Saliba. Like I haven't got a centre back that I like enough to say let's sign a centre back. I'm not as high. Diamandi as you and Curran. I've said that to you multiple times. I've I've joked over the top, like, oh he's shit and whatever. He's not, but like I don't I'm not as high on him. Um like Danzo I haven't watched in a while. Um there's a couple Gway he's too expensive, he's been injured for a while as well. Um can I advocate spend, spending what 60 mil? They probably ask for Gwehi when we need starters. I'm not sure. So, yeah, I, if a few Hernandez is available, then you have to look like if a left back of that caliber is available. When I don't like what Zinchenko offers both ways, and I don't like like Theo at times can get caught too tight and he he brings men down wherever. Like he's not Tommy defensively, but offensively he's probably our best player. Um, do you think Arteta would even want an overlap on the left? Like consistent overlap, considering how much of a central midfielder he's been using our left backers. Well, we've been beco becoming more double pivot. We've been going back to some of his original stuff. We went from a period of basically going with you know two bases <clears> to basically have more double pivots in action. And I think uh, it it just it depends on what he wants to do, mate. Like I've seen him do both. That's the problem, and yeah. I think that we're losing two overlap. So, like, in a sense, I would love us to recruit one. Because we, in, even though I don't love him, Zinchenko is an inverted option. So, like, we yeah. have the profile. We don't have an option to basically do something different. And I think that I'm just a fan of having an option to do it. And that's actually why, when I look at it, 
even though I've, I've built, you're in a group chat with me, I've built how many summer windows? I'm starting to settle on this idea of an Osman, Theo, Fernandez, and Joshua Kimmich window because yeah. it solves so many things in the squad. It gives us an overlapping option, which helps us in terms of both a DM replacing Jorginho, also an alternate right back solution, Timber coming back. I've got another option in midfield, you know, and it gives me that big marquee forward. So I'm starting to look at that. And I'm thinking Kimmich gives me some half space crossing as well to aim at yeah. and then you know there's there's things there that gives I you can... late wins into the box like the goal he scored against us. Yeah, and his experience, mate. Like it's world class. That's three options, bang, 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 that are two hundred million because I think Victor Osman's a, a release clause is one hundred and three million pounds, and then you've got um, Theo Hernandez was being spoken about for sixty million euros, which is what fifty one million pounds. Yeah. Joshua Kimmich is in the last year. So what would you say? 40 million pounds max? 35? Thiago went for 29 in his last year to Liverpool. Exactly. So so I think all in all, you're basically sat at just about 200, less maybe. And look, if you've got more, I've got more suggestions. But I think those three really do. I, I like that we're both in agreement on not signing a left center mid unless, unless yes. like elite, elite. Or like a I don't even have Madrid. an elite, elite option that I love, you know? I, I, like, no, I'm saying like, say a Real Madrid center mid gets open or like, oh, yeah, yeah. Madrid, like, like that, that, that player, if those players are put on the market, which is <laughs> unlikely, but if those players are put on the market and then we want to sign a center mid, then fairs, but like any anyone else to replace the left center mid option, I wouldn't want. I agree with this, though. I don't want Havertz to play such a big role. He's probably my... Back up nine going into next season, and Jesus is one of the wingers. Eddie probably leaves. Tierney probably leaves. Jorginho leaves. Cedric probably leaves. We have probably called up call up to that like 10, 10 outgoings and probably ten sales next in the window. But yeah, that's, I think we're going to speak more and more on the window as we get closer to the window and into the window. Thanks. Yeah, we also have the Euros, which probably prolongs the window. The window talk. <laughs> there will be talk in the Euros of players that will play well at the Euros, and fans will want, and then we'll get a link to them like there is every tournament. But yeah, I'm pretty positive on the season so far. Um, next time, see as Chaos has said, next time City play, if we if we beat what's it called Wolves and Chelsea. As I said, visually, it'll be very beneficial to look at the table on your phone and see Arsenal's top of the league. It's a bit of delusion, but it is what it is, whatever whatever we can use to push us forward into actually winning the league. And you do that. The league is not over until we're a game back, a game behind, in my opinion. If we don't rotate this weekend, we don't beat Chelsea. So, yeah, that's my thing for the next week. I think Tottenham, we can win because there's a bit, a, a bit of a bigger gap, but... What do we have a Sunday, Monday turnaround and then we play Chelsea? So, yeah, big, big. We have to use some of our players, man. They, they're wasting time on the bench. But, yeah, that's pretty much it from me. Um, as the title says, the UCL dream is over for now. Is the season over? No. Because um, the league is still, we're still in contention. But we don't have it in our hands. We can end the season, I think, on 89 points. <laughs> And not win the league. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. And bottling. <laughs> yeah, you bought it. But, yeah. We should bottle more often in that case. Um, look, I think, uh, <laughs> look I, I think all in all, uh, everyone's emotions are high. I'm excited. I think uh, no matter what happens, um, I've seen progress this season. I've seen things I didn't like. I think I saw things that annoyed me because I would have hoped that he's learnt some things, yeah. you know? And there's some things that he's improved. Like, I think in general, his substitutions are still late, but on the season, he's been able to change more games than he did last year. But yeah. it's not it's not as much as I want. So it's but like... it's also going to the point, sorry to cut you off, where yeah. I know Trossard and Jesus are coming on if they don't stop. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm 100% sure who's coming on. And that's dangerous. Which I think has been almost like a regression to the season before. Like, I could argue the, the first six to seven months, I was seeing more willingness for him to be creative in the subs. Yeah. And 
it's kind of reverted back now that he's got pressure back to what he normally did prior, which is frustrating. But look, um, I'm confident. We'll see what happens. Uh, thank, thanks, everybody, for joining with us. We really appreciate the support. Um, and, you know, uh, thank you guys for checking in. Uh, make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications so you know when we do upload. And you can find us on Twitter at CKFTBL for Chris yeah. and then me at George V underscore AFC. So thank you guys so much, and we'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace. Peace.